Welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. To me, being perfect is not about that scoreboard out there. This is a chance of a lifetime. When you can understand the person, you can then work towards a common goal. We are all on the same team. Now you roll and do it to the best of your ability. Focus on the fundamentals. We've gone over time and time again. Your defense has got to be better. Leave no doubt tonight. Great moments are born from great opportunity. Hello and welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. This week, my co-presenter is the gold medal winning volleyball coach, Hugh McCutcheon. And he and I continue our exploration of thriving teams with the American football coach, Mike Blomgren. Mike started his career in 2000 as a graduate assistant at the University of Alabama. He then held various assistant roles before eventually moving to the New York Jets in a quality control position in 2007. From there, he moved to Stanford under David Shaw, where he was part of the coaching staff that won the Pac-12 championship in 2012, 2013 and 2015. In 2017, he was appointed as the head coach of Rice University. And just before we go to the interview, today's podcast is brought to you by the Macquarie University Business School's MBA program. Designed to empower, challenge and transform, the Macquarie MBA gives you the business skills and knowledge you need to succeed in an evolving global economy. The program bridges the gap between theory and real-world application, bringing together world-leading professors, executives and industry partners to teach you how business can be used for good. I have just started working with the team at Macquarie on some projects and can attest to the quality of the people and material. To find out more, search for Macquarie University Business School's MBA. And now, please enjoy our interview with Mike Blomgren. You're listening to The Great Coaches Podcast. Coach Blomgren, good morning and welcome to The Great Coaches Podcast. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate you having me. Well, we're very happy to have you on today. And of course, I'm joined by my co-host today, another great coach, Hugh McCutcheon. Hugh, how are you today? Yeah, doing well. Thanks, Paul. Always a, always a pleasure to be here. And coach, nice to join you and thanks for joining us. Very cool. Indeed. So Mike, Hugh and I are going to tag team through this interview today as we sort of Deep dive on your career, leadership, and I think all things team dynamics and, and uh, thriving teams. So I'd like to start, though, if I could, by just talking about some of the, the great coaches that you've worked with. There's, I can see in your background there's Rex Ryan. There's, of course, David Shaw, Bobby Bowden. Of course, you've, I'm sure that you've met some others on your journeys as well as you've uh, seen them from the other side of the field. But I wanted to start by asking you, what is it you think the great coaches do differently that sets them apart? Yeah, that's a great question. I think with those three in particular, those are all genuine people. And, you know, so many times I get asked questions, hey, what's Coach Bowden like off camera? What's Rex Ryan like off camera? And in both cases, it's like what you see is what you get. Like that's exactly who those people are. Uh, I think all the coaches that I've worked under, I've definitely taken something from. And, you know, I I look back at Coach Bowden, and it was such a grandfatherly type approach. He set expectations and allowed his staff to follow through on them. Uh, And he was so different because he was like uh, Coach Bear Bryant. He coached from a tower. He wasn't even on the field with us. But what was amazing is in staff meetings the next day, what he could see. Like there's some things that would happen on the field, and I'd look up, and, and his back was to us. And he'd bring it up and stab me the next day. And that's how I knew he had a little divine guidance, uh, a little bit of help there. But he, he literally seemed to see everything and have eyes in the back of his head. I think Dennis Franchoni, the guy I was with at Alabama, you know, he was amazing at making everyone in the building feel like they were a part of our success on Saturday. Like they, he had the janitor understanding that like how they cleaned the building and took care of our players was going to help us win. And, and that, I thought that was such a cool thing. Uh, when I got to New York with the Jets, Eric Mangini came from the Belichick school. He had been with the New England Patriots. So we did so many things like that and really taught me the importance of situational football. I feel like I got my PhD in football being with the Jets. But 
the importance of situational football and, and how it wins games and it really just broke it down differently than anything I'd ever seen. I think Rex Ryan was amazing at taking people from all different backgrounds in a locker room and get them to come together and pull the rope in the same direction. David Shaw, you know, you, you always got something magical when you work for somebody and they become one of your best friends. Like that's just special. But I, I thought that the culture, which is the word everybody uses nowadays, but the environment that he created for the players and coaches in the building where everybody wanted to, to be in the building, everybody wanted to be around each other. I just thought it was so cool. I mean, I, my seven years at Stanford, I felt like I worked at Disneyland, like it was the happiest place on earth. And uh, so, again, took a lot from all those people. But uh, that's what I would say is, is all those people were genuine. All those people were kind of knew their strengths. And I would think that Coach Shaw probably did the best job of hiring people maybe for some of his blind spots. And then, again, allowing us to do our job while constantly supporting us and creating a great environment. Um, and I do think you're right. I mean, that authenticity piece is so critical. Uh, you know, as they say, you can, uh, you can fool a fool, but you can't kid a kid. If you're not, if you're not <laughs> being true to who you are, uh, it, it, they'll, they'll smell rat eventually. So how did, you, uh, how did you choose to get into coaching? You know, because it's, it, it's, not, um, it's not a typical career path as in like there's no real academic rigor around it uh you know but but yet here you are and you made that decision what what really got you passionate about coaching yeah I think first off like I never wanted to be a college coach I never wanted to be a pro coach I wanted to be a high school coach and that is simply mm -hmm. because my high school head coach Mike Hickman and the way that he took me under his wing the way that he righted my ship uh if you will I was probably going down some bad paths and, and he basically, through football and through a team, put me on a much better path and made me fall so in love with this game. And that was really my desire. I was like, you know what? That guy helped me so much and changed my life. I'd love to do that for some other individuals. And I, I think I've found ways to do it, not being in high school. I mean, there's, there's people at every level of sport and in every phase of their life that need your help. And as long as you're willing to be open and give it to them, um, I, I think you can make some – uh, differences in people's lives and, and make them better fathers, husbands, uh, you yeah. know, down the road. Yeah, I'd agree. I think those, tr those transformational opportunities probably present themselves a little bit better in, in the high school format. But, but that being said, I think college pros, all the levels, um, you know, that those opportunities to not just influence their, uh, their sporting acumen, but to, to help them develop as people is real. I think that's, a, that's a real thing. No question. How fortunate that you got to work with that coach. You know, how great. Uh, I'm sure probably one of the things that we know about coaching is that we know there are ripples. We just don't know how far they go. And uh, here's someone that was just really good at their job but ended up having a profound influence on what you ended up choosing to do with your life. Pretty amazing yeah. stuff. And changed um, my life, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, not, not just the direction. I mean, this game's been so good to me in so many ways. But the fact that that, that guy really did, did so much to shape me. I'm a single-parent kid, so he was so much yeah. – uh, the, the father figure in my life. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, you know, you, you said you worked with Rex Ryan, which is uh, I'm sure an honor and a privilege to, to work with greats in any sport. But uh, you know, one of the things he said, he said about you, he says, you're full of energy regardless of how long you're working, which really impressed him. And so, you know, that one of the things we talk about is the idea of kind of energy giving and energy taking and, and coaching can be energy taking, no question. So how do you find that, uh, that, uh, whatever boundless energy that you bring to the job? I mean, for, for a, a coach of his acumen to comment on, on your ability to bring the juice, that's, that's a pretty big deal. So what's the secret there? Yeah, I think I just, number one, I love it. I mean, that's, that makes it easy. Right. But I think if you're juiceful, you're useful. There's so many yeah. times on a Saturday morning where we're going to have a scrimmage in spring um, where like I'd have the staff put juice boxes in each player's locker just to remind them like this is this is the juice we need from you. This is what your teammates need from you today. And I just think energy is everything like to right. be great at anything. Passion has to be an ingredient. And, you know, what, what did Lou Holtz say about coaching, right? Like he said, uh, if you're not fired with enthusiasm as a coach, you will be fired with enthusiasm. And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, all jokes aside, and enthusiasm and juice are contagious. And, uh, and that's on me to help our coaches and leaders of our team 
make the weather, you know, for that day and, and talk about how great today's going to be, regardless of what challenge might be ahead of us, regardless sure. of what the, in Houston, like we're going to practice in 107 degrees, right? Like, and so that, that is an actual physical thing where we've got to make the weather, of, man, what a great opportunity we got today to go out there and play football together and get ready. Cause you know what, we're going to play games in this. And if you're mm-hmm. going to fight in the North Atlantic, you better train in the North Atlantic or in this case in Houston, Texas and, and the, uh, the hotness of it. But I think right. the challenges that we all have, you know, like we have an opportunity, the, the old story about a thermometer versus a thermostat, like one, can tell you what's going on while the other one can change what's going on. And I think that element of change and a lot of that comes from, from juice. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, I think the word energy is really important there because a lot of, a lot of people want to reduce it to emotion, but that's more of a response, whereas energy is an intention. And so the fact that, like you're saying, you're dictating the temperature in the room versus just reflecting on it, that that's a big deal. So yeah, good on you. Mike, one of the interesting things is I've, I've interviewed, a few coaches now from Ivy League universities, and they all often talk about the fact that their athletes are brighter than they are, and they talk about it quite openly. Now, you're at Rice, which is known for its academic focus, so I am pretty sure that there's quite often some pretty intelligent people in the room with you, and I'm I'm wondering what elements of your leadership are most challenged in this environment? Yeah, I've said for years I'm the dumbest guy in the room, and I love it. You know, and I, I believe that to be true. Uh, I do think it's amazing how working at Stanford for seven years and now going into year seven at Rice makes people think I'm so much smarter than I am. Um, but like I think about those kids and I, I don't really know the downside to working with brilliant kids like or the challenges to leading them. I actually think it's an asset. So uh, I'd love to flip the question on you for a second. Like out of curiosity, what are some of the challenges those Ivy League coaches brought up? Oh, I think they often... There was, there was one guy, Andy Shea, and he sort of talked about the fact that he didn't, it sort of altered the way he gave advice. He sort of moved to a more questioning method to sort of challenge people to sort of come up with their own ideas themselves. And I think the other thing is it sort of, when they self-reflected, they sort of, there was an, oh, who was the other, um, Mary, uh, Kathy Delaney Smith from Harvard. And she sort of, when she self-reflected, it was, it became less about being perfect and smart and more about conducting the energy in the room. I think that was probably two of the things that I, I remember on the spot. But they did talk about it challenging them. I would co-sign on that, um, allowing them to talk and through questioning. Like I, I always thought that was one of the coolest things about my meeting room at Stanford, whether I was the coordinator or the offensive line coaches, being in there. And it's really something I learned from Bill Callahan and watching him do it with the Jets. Like, what do you feel here? What do you think would be the best way to get there? And uh, sometimes listening to these players, and especially because we had some unbelievable players in New York, like Nick Mangold, uh, Alan Fanica, guys with these awesome experiences, Damian Woody, and to let them talk about, Coach, I did it this way here. And a lot of times what at Stanford, I would get them in their own words back to what I wanted. But then it was their idea, and it was going to lock in better, and they were committed to it because it was their idea. And so it's amazing how much uh, more often they would make that happen, uh, if that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. I mean, questioning, I think it's the same in the corporate world, isn't it? Or any kind of sporting team, really. The more that you can get people to embrace the challenge themselves, I think it works better. And Hugh, I've interviewed a lot of country, uh, coaches from New Zealand, and they see it seems to be part of the DNA. You know, they talk mm-hmm. about, um, what was it, the query theory was one way I heard them describe it. Right, right, you know, yeah. Trying to go through the day with only asking questions. But uh, I'd like to just extend on this idea of uh, of – intellectual energy if I can Mike because I've actually heard you describe the culture you're trying to build at Rice as intellectual brutality now I I really caught my eye and I'm wondering if you could just unpack it a little bit for us and tell us how it works yeah so in 2013 was my first year I became the offensive coordinator at Stanford and uh, the defensive coordinator was Derek Mason who went on to become the longtime head coach at Vanderbilt University he's now the head coach at Middle Tennessee and uh, is a dear friend of mine. But Derek came up with farm tough. And Stanford is regarded as the farm because mm-hmm. of all the acreage it's on. So he talked about the defense being farm tough that spring. And I was like, what, what in the heck is something that suits us? You know, like and what we do offensively. Uh, and I just started thinking through those things and had a buddy of mine. We were actually at the beach in Florida talking through possible things, uh, bouncing things off of. What do you think about this? He had some great ideas. And we got to intellectual brutality. 
And what that means to me is the kids that we bring into Stanford or Rice are brilliant. So that is one of their strengths. Like, why would we not utilize that to the fullest? If we didn't, we'd be in error. Uh, so on offense, defense, or special teams, like we often take the field with multiple play possibilities, right? And so based on how the other team aligns or what personnel they have on the field, it could be play A, B, or C. We could kill the first play, as we say, and you'll see our quarterback do that. Or we could say alert and go to our mouth. Uh, an example could be like on offense here, it could be like, Green right, Z short, 96 power, kill, 96 force, uh, alert, hound two, double go. And so one of those three plays is going to be ba best based on what the quarterback sees. And there's a lot of teams in college football now that look to the sideline. It's kind of like mother may I. You know, it's like asking their coach if they can run the play. We've got these smart kids. Why wouldn't we train them to make the decisions in real time and much faster than we could signal anything in? So really that's the intellectual part. Uh, the brutality part is, you know, in American football, like recognizing that our game is meant to be played in a very physical manner. And the best feeling in our game is imposing your will on your opponent to win your one on one to allow the team to be successful. So when the ball turns over, we want to unleash hell on our opponents. And like it's a belief that we're more physical and better prepared than you are. So put the ball down and let's get it on. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Hugh, does any of that resonate with you and the way that you would? construct similar uh, culture descriptions with your teams? Yeah, no, I think the the idea of empowerment versus control is really critical in coaching. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a choice that all coaches get to make, but the idea of uh, b being in control where the, where the athletes are constantly looking over at the coach mm. for direction about how to, how to manage a particular circumstance is uh, maybe it makes the coach feel good uh, but I don't think it helps the athlete. <laughs> you know, at some point, all you're doing is creating codependency. You're not. You're not actually creating independent thought. And and so, for, for me, certainly a big a big tenant of the way I wanted to coach people was to empower them with the knowledge they needed to make the right choice at the right time. It seems like that's critical because they're the ones that are in the field of play. They're the ones that are doing it. No, Hugh, I was just going to ask. Like, you've had so much success coaching men and women, and like, what are the things toughness wise that you instill in your team and what are the non-negotiables for your team to make sure that they all can reflect and realizing if they're meeting your standard or not? Well, first of all, the standards are set by the environment that you're in. You know, I've, I've had a, a, a unique career, I guess, in that I've, you know, coaching Olympic men, Olympic women, college men, college women, professional men, all these different levels that require different levels of execution to be successful in those realms. And so to that end, really identifying what, what were the key elements of, of the game that correlated most highly to success and then and then what standards of execution in those particular skills mattered. And then from there, you know, it gives a lot of clarity around what you're going to work on today and, and hey, did we meet the standard or not? Because I, I generally felt the more I could objectively define the standard versus subjectively offer my opinion on it, it was easy to hold people to it when it was just kind of like, hey, the grass is green, the sky is blue, we did or we didn't. It's just that. And and as a coach, I think our job, no doubt, is to mentor and, and to motivate. Uh, but I think primarily it should be, hey, let's hold you to the standard. So if we're going to hold you to the standard, let's be really clear around what that looks like. And then none of this is punitive because – the moment, you know, you, you're not playing Tommy and he's on the bench, well, it's not because he's not meeting the standard. It's because you don't like him. It turns out you like Timmy more and you always have, right? But but the reality of that circumstance is like, hey, this kid's meeting the standard. You're not. It's not that we don't like you. It's not that anything other than you've got to improve these particular areas. And I think that affords a real, you know, to your point of authenticity, there's, there's some honesty in those moments. There's some authenticity in those moments that allow the athletes to really take full responsibility for what they're contributing, for their performance. So, yeah, the toughness thing, though, is real, right? Because what is tough? And to me, toughness is executed by can you do your job when we need you to do your job? Can you be at your best when your best is needed? And that might be yelling and screaming or that might be hooting and hollering, but it might be just quietly getting stuff done. And and so, again, that has to be expressed authentically, but helping athletes identify uh, ways that they can excel in those big moments. And we all know that matches, games, seasons, at some point, everything's on the line. It gets big in a hurry. 
So preparing him for that moment right out of the gate from the first day of preseason, talking about the fact that that's going to be a thing, I think that helps them to get there and manage it in the end. But anyway, enough for me. Yeah, Love enough it. for me. All right. Well, listen, I've got a question for you. you. You've got a lot of stakeholders, right? You've got a ton of athletes. You've got a ton of coaches. You've got all these different silos. Um, although, and I use that term not as a descriptor of the fact that they're siloed, just that you have all these different pockets. Indeed. So how do you, how do you connect them? How, how do you, how do you, you know, like you talked about uh, the coach that was making sure the janitor believed that the way he was cleaning the toilets was impacting what happened on the weekend. I mean, tell me about that. How, how do you go about connecting those people? Because they, they all matter. You're right. Indeed. Uh, well, talking specifically about the players and the coaches and for people who don't know American football, like in, in college now for the spring, even though we won't play a game, we get 15 practices along with workouts and uh, opportunities to grow our team together, uh, which to me is that connection. And right now we have 107 players in the building and we have 50 staff members and their families. So it is a big organization. It's not, you know, it's not a, a a baseball team or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination. And so I think you've got to make a concerted effort and have a great plan for that connection. Uh, some of the things we do, uh, many of them involve breaking bread, which again, I think as everybody thinks of an American football player as a big guy, we know they like to eat. And so that is a way straight to their heart. Uh, so we break bread and have, you know, meals with those student athletes. Uh, my charge for our staff in February is I want you to have two meals with your position group, which position mm -hmm. groups could be anywhere from four to 20 players, mm -hmm. depending on the position that that individual coaches. So two meals with each position group and one individual meal with each member of your group. And these meetings are not intended to talk X's and O's. Like these are, these are check-ins about life, about family. And uh, I think those have a lot of importance as we head into spring ball in March. And, and March will actually shift gears because they'll be with their position coach every day in either meetings and or practice or just meetings. Uh, and we go to what we call small groups and the groups are chosen by me, uh, my assistant, Sydney Davis and our head strength and conditioning coach Hans Straub. And the goal is to put players with coaches that they would not otherwise come in contact with in the building. Mm. And so it ends up being three to five players with each with each coach, if you will, or each staff member, I guess I should say, and they'll grab meals together. And my goal is for them to make it clear to those players that they have another advocate in our building, another person that genuinely can, cares about them and does not control playtime. And so to be clear, what that would look like is an offensive, a 300 pound offensive lineman may be with our corners coach you know, who normally coaches these really small, fast kids. Mm -hmm. And so, again, they build a bond and a relationship. It's just another thing that, that helps with that connectivity. Uh, it, last summer, we started bringing in an outside company by the name of Amplos. We had a facilitator named Brian Selman, who was awesome. And they do what they call skull sessions. And these skull sessions, there's a different topic every week. And they're, they're to help them remove roadblocks to performance, as well as roadblocks to connectivity as a team. And to overcome things. And, and so it was really good because it's it's great content. The first four skull sessions are run by the coaches. The last four are run by the leaders of your team, where they have to prepare the material, where they have to be the one presenting and facilitating those discussions. And we found that to be a really good deal for us last year. Uh, I think lastly, like we take advantage of every holiday, like and we're going to celebrate it. We're going to celebrate it again with food. And, uh, you know, you just wouldn't believe the volume associated with competition. Like our guys love to compete in everything. So it could be cornhole, it could be can jam or slam ball. And mm -hmm. like you'd think like the Super Bowl was going on the way everybody's competing and cheering. And uh, but I just think all those things, kind of the sum of all those things, putting in the time and effort, it validates that our staff and their teammates care about them and uh, their success on and off the field. No, I think that's important. And those, you're right, those connections, of course, they're, you know, they're hard to quantify, but you know, they matter. And, yes. and, and I think, especially in this day and age for athletes to feel like you care about them as a person, not just as a competitive commodity is really important. Um, but, but to that end, you know, the relationships matter, but, but we also got to show up on the weekend and we got to produce, you know, I mean, and and not that those things are mutually exclusive, but 
but where I'm going is, you know, what do you think is the the purpose then of, of what's driving your organization, your team, you know, your program? What, what's the what's the goal? What what's the the big rock that that you're all chasing? Yeah, I think competition, growth, and love. Like if you put it in those three buckets, because although because I don't think they're mutually exclusive, I think they have a direct impact on what happens on game day. And mm-hmm. so with that belief, I think as much as we can can compete and make iron sharpen iron, as much as we can grow and identify the things and, and not be in our own feelings, not be uh, have our feelings hurt when we're corrected by a teammate or by a coach, mm-hmm. or certainly like if we're not meeting a standard, being able to take in that that feedback and realize, yes, I was not meeting that standard and understanding the standard's not a goal. It's the bare minimum acceptable. And then I can grow. And then the whole time with both of those competition and, and growth going on, knowing that I am loved by this organization, like they, they value me for my play and they value me for more than that. All the mm-hmm. contributions I make and they care. And so I think that's really big. I think like at my core, if you ask me the mission statement of rice football, I'd say play great football and graduate with a world-class degree and like, don't go. let anything get in the way of those two things. But, you know, I, I think we've all been on those teams. I think when we see magic happening, it's when a guy cares more about the guy in the locker next to him's success uh, than he does his own. And, and that's when those are, those are fun to be a part of. You can do some really special things. No doubt. And, and to that end, obviously, you know, you're talking about grow and, and, and over the last seven, eight years since you've been there, things have, have obviously progressed really nicely. And, and, you know, you got to your first uh, bowl game last year. Is that right? And postseason play and, so it was our second bowl game, but it's the first one we My got apologies. six wins. Second in a row. No, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, seven years, it's a big chunk of uh, of time. Um, some patience, uh, some belief. I'm sure there were some moments where uh, there, there might have been a doubt or two. Uh, you know, tell me about that. How, how, how did you feel about that? Yeah. So, I mean, the, it did not happen as fast as I thought it would. Right. Like mm-hmm. we all think like we can make these sweeping changes. And, and, you know, I mean, I think as coaches, we have a tendency to be just like the rest of the world. Like, God, give me patience and give it to me now. You know, and uh, I, I don't know that this path has helped me with patience, uh, but it's taught me to stick to my guns and keep swinging, you there know, you and surround yourself with great people who will stay in this fight with you and stay positive, which is a hard thing to do. There's, there's a couple Dwight Eisenhower clips or quotes, if you will, that I think are outstanding and I'll probably butcher them, but it's optimism and pessimism are infectious and they spread more rapidly from the head down than in any other direction. Right. So if you're right. negative as a leader, like watch out now, your organization is about to look just like that. And, and I firmly believe that. And the other thing he said was he was like, my mannerisms and speech in public would always reflect like victory, like mm-hmm. my belief that victory was coming and any pessimism or discouragement I might ever feel, I reserve for my pillow. And I think that's so <laughs> important, right? Like you're I going to have some things like that. But in conclusion, like I think if you have a process, that roadmap, and that you're convicted it will work, put in the work, learn to recognize and celebrate progress. In our program, we call it celebrating the small Vs. Yep. And so uh, one, one of our players a couple of years ago when we had small Vs on our T-shirt, it's like, hey, if, if if my teammate does this for me, that's a small V. If I do this for him, that's a small V. And if you put them together, it's a W. And that's how we win is those go. small Vs get us there. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, and it's so true. I I I, uh, I use the term belligerent optimism uh, to describe <laughs> that process because, like, and it's it's rooted though in the reality. Like, if you don't believe in what you're doing, it's so hard to get anyone else to believe in it. And so at those moments when you're waking up at four in the morning, like we all do, wondering what the hell we're doing, we've got to have fundamental belief and conviction in our process. We may not have the the outcomes that we want. We understand that. But, hey, we're doing it the right way. Or at the very least, we can figure out how to get it done. To me, that that confidence, that optimism is is essential. And it's not arrogance. It's it's got to be confidence, you know, because arrogance is an an overestimation of your ability. I think confidence is belief in your ability, and that's what you need. Yeah, really. I agree. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike, I've heard you talk quite often about the fact that your time with the the players is precious. So you want your staff to be prepared. In fact, it comes across in your answers earlier when you talked about the structure you're bringing to the next couple of months and breaking bread. But I wanted to just take a little sidestep from that 
um, actually. And I'm wondering, do you bring the same structure to the way that the team captures learning and then shares it across the 107 players and 50 staff? Yes. And so, like, we have ways that we teach everything. And we have a couple different ways of teaching, which I think are outstanding. And, and the best way is, like, we show a picture of a play, whether it's an offensive, defense, or special teams play. Then the next page is going to be a description of what each player should do on that play. And then we have video. And I think that that's the best way to learn aside from kinesthetic reps, but that's the best way to give them an example of what that should be. And I think like in that, yeah, you talk about the structure of, of learning, like I guess process more than routines, right? Like coach Bowden always said that our time with the players is so precious and limited that a coach should spend twice as much time planning that period of time than the actual event. So if you have a one hour meeting, you should spend two hours preparing that meeting with your, you know, so you can deliver the material in a succinct way. You can have all of your teaching aids the way you want it, all your cut-ups the way you want it, and, and just be able to be a great teacher in that limited way to make sure that we're teach reaching and demanding, right? Like teaching in such a way we reach every player in that meeting room and then going on the field and demanding it's done that way. Interesting. I, you, this idea of uh, structure and preparation is also mentioned a lot when it comes to your recruiting. I mean, you've won early in your career, you were given awards for the quality, I think, of your recruiting and the depth of, of that recruiting. I wasn't able to see why it was uh, classified so great. So I just had to uh, accept that the award was there. But I'm sure it was more than just choosing great players. I'm sure there was more to it than that. So these days, when it comes to populating this organization you know it's so big but are there any you used the word a minute ago big rocks are there any big things that you you look for that are non-negotiable when selecting people to come to rice yeah i think first off the answer is yes um I, i think the biggest responsibility i have as a head coach is the people i allow to come in the building and be part of this team and that's whether there's a staff member or as a player I think everybody in our organization needs to be smart, tough, competitive. And like, this is a big one. This is one that Dave Shaw and I used to talk about when we were hiring people. And that's like, do we like these dudes? You know, people often talk about fit, but like we used to ask the question, like, do they fit in the submarine? Do we want them in our submarine? Because as August rolls around, right? Like we're going to, it's goodbye dear football is here. And I'm going to spend more time with those players and coaches in the fall than I do my own family. So I better legitimately like them. That just makes everything flow better. We also talk all the time about like, you know, when you hire these smart people and you bring them in from different places, like there's an old saying, there's a lot of ways to get to Chicago. A lot of roads lead there and a lot of them work. But at the end of the day, we've got to have somebody that is going to understand that our coordinators are in charge. And when they make a decision, we're going to go in to our meeting rooms and sing out the same hymnal and make sure we're, we're selling this information to make everybody believe this is how we're going to win the game this week. And you got to make sure you got people that don't have uh, maybe personal agendas. They got to be part of the team and they've got to understand the structure you have in place. I want to shift gears a little bit uh, coach and, and maybe have a look at the mental game. I know it's something that you, you stress is is part of your program and you should i mean obviously the the body can't do anything without the mind telling it what to do so uh to that end do you find that uh maybe having clarity in the way that you coach um mental strategies uh you know maybe influences the way you uh you deal with your own family and does it does it get outside of coaching is it transferable to life do you reckon I think it's absolutely transferable to life. I think we all want to push for excellence in whatever we're doing. I think that the human body wants that. It just needs to know the right path and, and the right way to get there. Um, you know, our dinner table is always just that. Like my, my kids and wife will look at me and be like, I, we don't need you to coach us. And like, I look at my wife and I'm like, look, you knew what you were getting into. And for my kids, I'm like, look, pay, people pay big bucks for this coaching and knowledge you get for free, man. Enjoy it. Soak it up. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Keep the running tab. Yeah. Very good. And at one point um, you said that you always wanted to talk to people that you thought were great at where you wanted to be. Um, Can you tell me, you know, a little bit more about that whole idea of, of, it feels like you're talking more about mentorship or something like that, or, you know, is there, is there something there? Is there a strategy behind that? It's an interesting way of framing it. Yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I think we're crazy if we don't 
like reach out to those people that are experts in any field, but certainly in the ones that we're pursuing. You know, I think back to coaching offensive line and I, I was fortunate. I was trained under two great coaches, Jim Bob Helduzer at Alabama and Bill Callahan at the Jets. And uh, once I got to Stanford, I developed a relationship with the New England Patriots offensive line coach, the, the guy that was there forever, Dante Scarnecchia. And mm-hmm. those guys were so good to me. I mean, they picked up the phone when I called, they gave me time and they helped me uh, give me the ability to make my players better. And any challenges I faced, they were always there for me. Uh, so there's no chance I, I ever could have become the coach that I am today without people like that. And I think the same is true today. Like my ability to pick up a phone and call somebody who's a current head coach or who's been a head coach and sat in that chair um, and just get their their feedback and their opinions. And, hey, how would you handle this? Like I, nobody's as smart as all of us. And, and the more that we can utilize those people, like I, I just don't think I have all the answers and, and I'm always trying to learn. And I'm so blessed to have access to those people. Mm, love it. And you're right. I mean, I think the minute we start thinking we've got all the answers, it's, uh, it's when we're really in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Anyway, um, last thing for me, you know, I mean, criticism and, and I mean, we live in this strange world, obviously, with um, unfiltered opinion following around at every, at every corner. And, uh, you know, not, not everyone's going to agree with what you do or the decisions you make. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? You know, when people want to, and, and, and I'm sure it doesn't happen that often, but heaven forbid they challenge a decision you make, uh, you know, what's your response there? How, how do you, oh. how do you deal with it? The inevitable slings and arrows. Yeah, they're coming, right? We know that. Right. Like that's part, part of what we signed up for. So mm. uh, I just, look, I have broad shoulders. I can take it all. Like, okay. like I worry about what the people in the building and their ability to see that the ship is moving in the right direction. Those are the people that I worry about from the staff to the players, those outside things. Um, they are what they are. They're part, they come yeah. with the territory. And I think like I go back to Roosevelt's man in the arena speech, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, it's something that has always helped me. Like everyone has their, their opinion. Some of them are not informed opinions. Um, and I have to understand and appreciate that their passion for the game and the team. And, and I get that. And I know that sports is the opiate to the masses, right? I get mm-hmm. that. And I, I love that we're all passionate about it, but I have to trust the training I've received from the great coaches I've worked under and, and know that we have a path that has worked before and will work again to get us to our next win. Love it. Yeah, you're right. Consider the source, right? And uh, you, you respond to everyone and you, you yeah, it's, it's, uh, first of all impossible but but it, it just it's uh getting in the way of what you have to do today to actually honor your commitment to your job so uh, you got to be really intentional with your with your time and energy with regard to that stuff yeah good on you all right paul mike just one final question for me if if we could um if my research is right your father-in-law was a colonel in the military i believe that's correct yes okay. yes sir and I've heard you actually talk about the fact in some of your previous interviews that you you talk leadership with him. But I also know that you've got a couple of uh, kids and the generations expect totally different things going forward. So I'm wondering, when your sons ask you for leadership advice, if they do, I don't know if they do, given your comment around the dinner table, but if they do, what would be the one or two top things that you would tell them? Really a kind of a synopsis of what we talked about so far, like be genuine, outwork everyone, be consistent. You know, I think leadership is a lot like parenting. And uh, the best parenting advice I ever got was from David Shaw's mother. And what she said was start as you mean to go on. You can always loosen the strings later, but it's hard to tighten. So start as you mean to go on and be consistent. Um, You know, I, I hear people all the time say leadership is a marathon, not a sprint. I think I think that's true. But I think sometimes it's both, especially early on when you're trying to build a culture and trying to get a bunch of people. It's kind of like you need all your leaders to be complete disciples. Like, I I don't know how anybody reaches 120 people. Like, they leave the meeting room after hearing the same voice, not playing the game of telephone, but you almost think they played the game of telephone because they got a different message out of it. You need your disciples, your leaders of your team. In my case, my coaches, my assistant coaches and the leaders of our team, our leadership council to go 
and repeat that message and make sure everybody understands why it's important and exactly what we need. And, and again, those standards are a great way. When we set those standards and we're clear about what those expectations are, we have a lot better chance of getting those things. The other thing that I tell my son, I think, is like leadership will be exhausting and it will be worth it to help your team meet their goals. Well, I think meeting goals is a pretty good way for us to finish. Although I did like the top comment about fitting in the submarine as well. Mike, it's been a pleasure to get to know a little bit more about your story today and what's happening there at Rice. It's um, it, Your energy is so infectious. I feel like I'm going to go out for a 10-mile run straight after this interview. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and Hugh, thank you for joining us as well and adding your perspective. So I, I appreciate it. And I wish both of you gentlemen a lovely day. Thank you both. Tr truly a pleasure. You're listening to The Great Coaches Podcast. So, Hugh, what a fantastic interview. He had, Mike had so much energy. What were some of the big things that you took out of it? Well, yeah, you know, to, his, to, that, to that idea of, of, of energy, I think, you know, one, he, he loves what he does. He's really clear about who he is and, and what he stands for, and, and he's passionate about it. And, and I think those are all really, really critical elements to, to sustaining anything in, in coaching or sport. Uh, it takes your, takes your head and your heart. And, of course, you've got two at times. But, but you know, you can't just like it. you got to love it. He clearly did. I loved some of the little ideas he had. Like, I love the idea of juice in the locker rooms. I thought that was really, yeah. really nice. I like the small Vs, and, and people will see it when we make the video, how they come together to form a W. And just this idea of fitting in the submarine. He had some really nice, small mm -hmm. ways, I think, of conveying big messages. Yeah. Well, and I think all all teams, all uh, organizations want to develop cultural language that that affords those opportunities. You know, the idea of chunking information, saying a little bit, meaning a lot, uh, lends itself to strengthening the values of the of the organization itself. So, uh, yeah, those things are really powerful um, when they're as clear and succinct as the, as the examples that he gave us. When you were listening to him, were you thinking about times where you've used similar, for example, cultural language? Was that resonating with you? Uh, no, I, I think when I was listening to it, it was I, I thought there was really strong alignment, not that it mattered, but it, it felt like, um, yeah, instead of comparison, it was more like, oh, yeah, I, 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 I see the value in what he was discussing. So, yeah, at no point was I thinking, oh, yes, there was that time we did that similar thing. It was more like, oh, yep, yeah, yeah, no wonder they're, they're turning it around. No wonder they're getting things going at Rice. I think they've got a lot of good stuff in place. Now, obviously, you know, there, any team is, is dependent upon the, the caliber of talent that you attract and, and the better athletes you get, the better coach you become. We know that. But in addition, coaching is this really, really important complementary piece. That talent is nothing until it gets developed and expressed in the field of play. So, you know, in as much as talent is important, it's not particularly rare. Having someone that can can foster that, nurture that, develop that, uh, like it seems a uh, coach can, I think that that's really important. That can be a difference maker. I also loved the idea of skull sessions because he's, by taking the word mental out of it, I think he's made it a little mm. bit more physical almost. He's making a little it more, more approachable, tangible. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. like that idea a lot. And he he talked a little bit about empowering the players and the staff to run the session. So I thought that was fascinating as well. I think any time you can get your athletes involved in those processes, it facilitates you know ownership, investment. Um, because I, you know, like I said, that they're the ones that have to that have to do it. So the more belief you can foster in them in terms of your processes and your values and your culture, then uh, the more resilient it's going to be. And just one, one last line that really caught my attention was he said, you know, the biggest responsibility you have as a coach is who gets to come in. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that before. Did that, how do you feel about that? Well, no, I think that's important because there's a, there's probably a narrative out there that, you know, you try to be all things to all people, but when you go down that path, I think it's then you're opening yourself up to a lot of variance in terms of the the character or the the qualities of, of of the people that are that are joining your organization. And so I think the more you can be clear about who you are and what you stand for, and 
perhaps most importantly, understand that you can't be all things to all people, then when you actually can recruit to that kind of principle or philosophical alignment, and of course the talent piece, then there's a chance for some really good stuff to occur. Uh, but when you get too, too many kind of disparate perspectives on all of that, I, I, I think it, it, it's hard to kind of unify the group around any kind of central belief or theme. You, as always, lovely to spend some time with you. Look forward to doing it all again very shortly. Yeah, truly a pleasure, as always, mate. Take care. All right, see ya.